Is there a particular order to how objects are installed in this gallery, let's say, as you, as you go from uh, the west side to the east side of the gallery? Yes, the western part of the gallery will um, show mainly Himalayan material. We use the Himalayas... If you t- listen to MuseCast, the official audio podcast of the Art Institute of Chicago, you may have heard in the November 2008 episode about the grand opening of the Alsdorf Galleries, the new galleries of Indian, Southeast Asian, Himalayan, and Islamic art. And then as you walk further in, you will be seeing... Medieval Indian. Uh, if you've been to the Art Institute in the past year or so, you may have noticed that the famed corridor of medieval armor, weapons, and decorative arts has been removed, much to the dismay of rambunctious adolescents and nostalgic gamers. Don't worry, it'll be coming back in a different and even better display, but that space, the long corridor that spans the commuter railroad tracks, has undergone an incredible transition from the musky medieval hall to the majestic, colorful, daylit corridor of South and Southeast Asian treasures. There's quite a feast of artwork on display here, including some works that may be a little familiar to avid listeners, like the Gandharan Bodhisattva from episode 7 of the Ancient Art Podcast, now exhibited among a number of his Gandharan contemporaries. One remarkable architectural element is the installation of a long set of windows, offering a sweeping panorama of the Art Institute's new modern wing, Millennium Park, and the Chicago skyline north of the park. Bright natural light's okay in this gallery, because all the exposed works are statuary made of stone, bronze, or wood, and whatever paint they originally had on them has long since disintegrated. But so as not to be confronted by a plodding series of dull gray sculpture, broad swaths of color have been added among the casework. Auspicious colors, exemplary of the cultures that produce these works of art. Like saffron, the color of sacrifice worn by the Buddhist monks of Tibet. Yellow, the color of the Indian Spring Festival, and red, the color of traditional bridal dress. Color is a very important part of South and Southeast Asian life. Nearly all the works surrounding us in this gallery were once originally vibrantly painted with a variety of colors, and also originally draped in fine textiles. Some works even retain part of the original coloration, not so much those in the Art Institute, but some works even in situ, like this 17th century granite sculpture of a divine marriage ceremony from the Madurai Temple in Tamil Nadu in southern India. Notice also the floral garlands draped over the figures. And in this 19th century Indian watercolor of priests worshipping the god Krishna, now in Australia. While it's a two-dimensional work, you can still get a sense of how the images of gods and goddesses were and still are today draped in extraordinary fabrics in Hindu and Buddhist temples. The colored panels in the Alsdorf galleries of Indian, Southeast Asian, Himalayan, and Islamic art serve to remind us that these works of art surrounding us are now stripped out of their original sacred context. These magnificent works of sculpted stone and cast bronze, while being beautiful works of art in their own right, were not created for the purpose of being displayed in a museum behind airtight glass in a precision temperature and humidity controlled environment. These sacred works are consecrated icons of divine beings. As in Western traditions, an icon or a work of art that undergoes a religious consecration is literally thought to house the spirit of the divine form. It's called the eye-opening ceremony when the icon is unveiled and awakens with painted open eyes as the spirit of the divine enters the figure. In the original context of a temple or shrine, one would expect to encounter these sacred works, like this 12th century Indian statue of the divine general Kartikeya, adorned with fine drapery, colorful pigment, flowering garlands, and all manners of religious offerings piled at his feet, like incense, flowers, food, and money. This colossal figure is one of the centerpieces of the Alsdorf galleries. He and the adjacent contemporary South Indian Buddha are hard to miss when passing through, but hopefully you'll do more than just pass through. Hopefully you'll even stop to enjoy these works on your way from the gift shop to the restaurant. The statue of Kartikeya exemplifies much of the rich iconography and symbolism of the Hindu tradition. The multiplicity of arms and heads reflect the celestial, superhuman quality of his divine form. Although, to be very specific, the six heads on Kartikeya here actually refer to the story surrounding his mystical birth, six heads to nurse from his six foster mothers. But multiple heads is a common element of Hindu iconography. Each of his hands holds some sort of ritual implement or weapon, each having a precise meaning, like the lotus blossom, Padme in Sanskrit, in one of his right hands, symbolic of enlightenment, the lotus flower rising from the murky depths of the marsh, out of the darkness up to the heavenly light of the sun, also symbolic of the feminine energy of the human spirit.
and the Vajra, or thunderbolt, in his upper left hand, symbolic of the masculine energy of the human spirit. The lotus and Vajra can be read together as a union, a balance between our feminine and masculine sides. People aren't one or the other. There's a duality to us all. To reach nirvana, to reach an enlightened state of being, we need to strike an internal balance, a harmony of these forces within. To borrow something from the Far East, it's like the yin and the yang, a harmony in the unified circle of two swirling opposites. We need to strike an internal balance between our compassion and wisdom. Interestingly, wisdom in the Hindu tradition is generally equated with femininity, whereas compassion is equated with masculinity. Kind of opposite to the Western tradition. Notice that two of Kartikeya's hands aren't holding anything. Those hands instead are striking very specific poses. It's called a mudra. A mudra is a gesture that conveys a specific message. There are hundreds of different mudras, each having their own specific meaning. Mudras are employed throughout Hindu and Buddhist iconography and can be seen repeatedly among the statuary and paintings of the Art Institute's galleries of Asian art. You'll also come upon the widespread employment of mudras in classical Indian dance. What Kartikeya is striking is very common. It's actually two different mudras. His right hand, with the fingers pointing up and palms forward, is the Abhaya mudra, the gesture of reassurance. With this mudra, Kartikeya is saying, fear not, rest assured, everything will be fine and I'll take care of you. Think of it like a hand stretched out to offer a reassuring pat on the shoulder. The mudra of his left hand is similar, palm facing out and fingers straight, but pointed downward instead. That's the Virada mudra, the gesture of charity or compassion. Think of it as a hand stretched out, either asking for or receiving alms. So these two mudras can be read together, conveying a combined message of don't worry, I'll take care of you, and everything will be peachy so long as you lead a good, charitable, and righteous life according to Dharma, the rule of law. Notice also the smoothly polished blackened regions along his legs, whereas the rest of the figure is somewhat rough and pocked with a dull gray color. The figure's made of granite, an incredibly hard stone. You might think of your kitchen countertop with its smoothly polished finish, but that's thanks to modern industry. Pre-industrial granite statuary is generally not so smoothly polished. What do you suppose would cause this discoloration in extremely smooth polish? Well, talking so much about hands just a few seconds ago, how about hundreds of years of people touching him on the legs? Remember, many of these works were originally consecrated icons. To touch the icon will bring you all that much closer in touch with the divine. Of course, stripped from that context and now placed in a museum, whatever spirit once resided in the works has long since left and touching won't do you any good and it'll just get you yelled at. Case in point, though, for why we don't touch the art at a museum. Something else that beckons our attention is his animal friend. What is that he's sitting on there? Some kind of bird, huh? It's a peacock. That's his regal mount, his trusty steed. In Sanskrit, it's called the Vahana, from which we get the word vehicle. Many of the prominent Hindu deities ride a Vahana. Kartikeya's is the peacock. The god Shiva rides a bull named Nandi. The beloved bulbous elephant-headed god Ganesha rides a curious little Vahana. It's kind of hard to see at the base of this exquisitely carved statue, but you can just barely make it out. It's a rat. You see, the association of elephants and rodents goes back well into ancient times. And Vishnu rides a half-man, half-eagle type of creature named Garuda. Sound familiar to anyone? How about Garuda Indonesia Airline? You see, these myths, stories, and divine beings are very much alive and well in the contemporary world. While the artwork we enjoy in the museum may be quite ancient and completely stripped from its original religious context, it's helpful to recognize that these works are still very much applicable to contemporary culture. The iconography, attributes, individuals, and stories are expressed very similarly in traditional artwork produced today by people of these regions and cultures. So as you wander about exploring the ancient, medieval, and antique works from South and Southeast Asia, think of them not only as works from the past, but also as contemporary emblems of the panoply of global culture. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to visit ancientartpodcast.org where you'll find credits for all the images used on the podcast, an extensive bibliography, links to other great resources, and recommendations from yours truly of other interesting podcasts. So long and keep on keeping on.